one of the questions that I always kind of had in the back of my head that I wanted to answer it is, you know, I was taught that if I was covered under the blood of Jesus, it didn't matter what I did, like, you know, how I sinned as long as I was covered by the blood. And at the time that I did have my near-death experience, I was under the blood of Jesus. So it really bothered me. Like, why did I go to hell? <laughs> you know, I was, hi, I'm Mani Menendez. I'm a psychic and I had a hellish NDE experience. Um, I ended up having a lot of childhood trauma and I didn't know that that was an issue. I didn't know how to deal with that. So I was just sort of trying to numb myself and figure things out. And I had started partying and got into drugs and I needed to get off of them. I was feeling very suicidal. I didn't want to be alive. And um, life was just too hard. And um, I just didn't understand why it was so hard for me. So I was lost in numbing myself, but I was almost at the point where I was like, I could tell I was going to die if I didn't do something about it. So I saw a sign on the side of the road by where I used to get the drugs in Newark, New Jersey. And it said about a medical procedure where you go to sleep and they would filter your body for four hours, four hour detoxification procedure by Dr. Lance Guberman. And it seemed like the easiest way out because I had tried everything else and it didn't work. So I tried it. My grandmother helped out with the money. It was very expensive for back then. It was over $2,000. And my mother took me and it was just supposed to be a simple procedure where they put you to sleep. They hook you all up. They put you, you know, under anesthesia and they, they push drugs into your body, which pushes out all the opiates. And then you wake up and you're clean. So it was a last ditch effort and they wanted my mom to sign the paperwork saying that if anything happened to me that they could not be held liable. And my mom tried to fight it and I told her it was okay because I was going to die either way. So she finally signed the paperwork and they put me to sleep and they told her they would come and get her in about four hours when it was over. And so they led her out to, you know, the hallway to wait and she was waiting and waiting, and waiting. And um, she kept asking and more hours were going by. And finally, she demanded to know what was going on. And um, they really didn't have an answer for her. They couldn't wake me up. And I was going through some things. Um you know, on the table, I was kind of like flailing around and making noises and uh, they didn't know what was wrong. And finally, after a while, um, I guess my mom was making a fuss. So they brought her in there to see if she could help in any way, I guess. It was kind of haphazard, the whole thing. And um she saw the doctors working on me and not being able to figure out what was going on. And I guess I was holding still and they were afraid if they were going to lose me or not. And I guess they sort of like got to a point where they gave up and they were like, we just have to watch and see because there's really, you know, they couldn't figure out what it was. And so my mom was really scared and she started praying and saying like talking into my ear and stuff like that and the psychic thing does run in our family and so I don't know if she was messaging me telepathically or like if source god allowed you know some of what she was saying to get into my consciousness but um I was in a hellish I was in hell basically <laughs> is what was happening to me. Um, and it was so horrifying that I forgot 
I knew I wanted to get out of there. That is like all I could think of at that time. It was like really excruciating. And um, it was like liquid fire. And it was not just me there. There were like tons of people there. And it was a very psychic place um, because every time my, I don't know if you want to call it soul or spirit or whatever is in us that once it leaves our body, um, when I would pass someone else's, I would feel all their pain. It's like we all instantly knew each other as we were passing each other and we could feel their torment. And our each own torment was like our like a worst collection of like whatever pain you felt on earth, like your worst pain. It was like that times a hundred. It was like extremely unbearable. And it was really weird because it was colors like they don't have here. So it's hard to describe. And it was a total lack of anything good. It was like a very low frequency or what people would call evil um, suffering place. It was just horrible. And the time was different there. So even though on earth it was just, you know, a matter of hours, the procedure was supposed to be probably four or five hours. And I think it went like hours over that. So even though it was not that long on earth, it, it was, it felt like months there. And um, to the point where I was there for so long, I just kind of forgot about earth and coming back, I was sort of giving up. And um, at that moment, that's when I heard my mom's voice. She said to me, call on Jesus, baby. Um, at that time, she had just started getting into Christian evangelical religion. And she tried to take me to church a few times. And I guess I was like nodding out because I was on drugs. <laughs> and she was crying in church. And um, I didn't really know too much about the Bible. I had never, I don't think they even ever read about like hell in the Methodist church much. And um, well, I was able to hear that. That was the one thing um, from the outside that I was able to hear in that moment. And it was like a light bulb went off. And that's what I did. I just screamed his name at the top of my lungs, like very loud. And then the next thing I knew, I was back on earth and hopped up in the hospital bed and I was ripping everything out of me. I had a trach and I was like pulling that out and I had all, all these tubes and every, all the machines they had on me while they were working on me and trying to figure out. I just, I was fighting them actually. I was so, it was like a wild animal that, you know, had just gotten free and that was in danger. And um, so I had that little burst of, you know, power coming back. But like, as soon as that was over, I just turned into a vegetable, basically. And um, I had to be in a wheelchair and I had to be carried and I had to have a diaper. And I couldn't eat and I couldn't really talk. I couldn't move. And I was just trapped in my body for about at least a week, I'd say. And um, my family would come to see me and I would hear them, you know, crying for me, praying for me, stuff like that. But um, I couldn't really communicate with them what I had seen yet or what had happened. But I was, you know, petrified and trying to make sense of it all. And I was just trapped in my body, just talking to God, talking to the angels. And um, I didn't know if they heard me and I didn't know if they were talking back to me, but I just remember, you know, telling them that I would spend the rest of my life telling people about what happened to me. So it happened so long ago and I've had so many like different spiritual awakenings and stuff. And each time I do, I see it like, through a different filter, a different perspective. 
And I feel like I just keep graduating to the nef- next level of understanding, you know, what happened to me, why it happened to me, what I'm supposed to do next, what the future holds for me. And so that's what I just keep doing, keep moving forward. I had another awakening during that time because I was presented with new information that kind of made me question everything that had been taught to me during my life. And one of the questions that I always kind of had in the back of my head that I wanted to answer it is, you know, I was taught that if I was covered under the blood of Jesus, it didn't matter what I did, like you know, how I sinned as long as I was covered by the blood. And at the time that I did have my near-death experience, I was under the blood of Jesus. So it really bothered me. Like, why did I go to hell? You know, I was even still kind of ticked off about it to this day. Like, you know, a lot of people have like heavenly experiences and I would have loved that, you know? Because I was just like a really spiritual girl. And and, um, so I wrestled back and forth with that. And I did a lot of investigation, especially in seminary when I learned about how the Bible was written, how many rewrites and translations it went through and everything. And um, that is when I started realizing that maybe it wasn't true that that I should not delve into my intuition and my psychic powers that I'd had since I was little. So I kind of had to dismantle all of the constructs that were taught to me, like by my family, by my parents. And I had to examine each thing and say, okay, what do I, what do I like about this? What am I taking with me? And, and what does this new information I'm being presented with change about my beliefs and also what I've been through. So I ended up where I am now, kind of like anti-organized religion. And I'm just like on my own. I communicate with beings without bodies. I feel really free. I'm not confined by any thought constructs. And I just go around talking to my angel and, you know, we're like partners and we do things together. And one of the main things that is really on our heart is children. And um, because of things that happened to me during childhood and stuff like that, I'm just really concerned about, you know, kids and abuse and stuff like that. And so, you know, we have ideas, we have a plan for the future um, just to help. And I also just, I want to help people in like a new way. I used to do it in the church, but I feel like the earth is evolving now and going to like a higher frequency and a lot more people are going to be getting like superpowers and not know what to do with them. And so there's a lot of people called star seeds who have been figuring out how to do this already and um we'll be there you know to sort of help if anyone wants or I don't know I don't know exactly what's going to happen but I know that that's what I've been being prepared for this phase of organized religion and I forget what a lot of astrologer astrologers were calling it um the church age I think it was called which is sort of like same thing as organized religion I think it's going to be moving to more people, quote unquote, waking up, becoming conscious and seeing into this new reality that we, that there doesn't need to be a middleman. Like all humans have this access. Like there's nothing special or extraordinary about me. It's that everyone is going to go Either they're going to go through an awakening and step into this new timeline where these things are available to us, where humans will be able to communicate with each other telepathically, where humans will be able to heal heal each other with energy um, from our energy centers, our chakras. And this is available to everyone. And I think at 
at first, it's going to be like a lot of people reject it and can't deal with it because it would mean that they were lied to about a lot of things. And this would thrust a lot of people into what's called a dark night of the soul. You know, I don't read the Bible anymore. Um, I was in Old Testament class and I read about the canon, like how the original books of the Bible came to be. And um, I was kind of shocked <laughs> and appalled because it kind of just, it very much discredited, discredited it for me, which made me then start thinking about the promises I believed in that the Bible had promised me and that I had wholeheartedly believed in and waited for and that <laughs> didn't happen and um I just kind of went went through the next few years with the new information I had about um colonization was a big thing I did a lot of research about colonization because of how the bible was made and um just made me realize that a lot of things weren't adding up and then I was thinking back also to how growing up in the church it was, even though I always wanted to be a pastor as a little kid, it was told to me that because I was a woman, that scripturally, that it was not allowed. And so just all these things I that kind of hit a nerve, like over my whole life, and, but over being an obedient Christian, you know, I had just kind of swept it under the rug. Well, it just set me off on this research tangent and, um, I just started realizing how messed up everything was, and I sort of have realized how being an obedient Christian and turning the other cheek and thinking of the best of people had also gotten me trapped into abuse. And so it was really hard for me because that's like all I ever believed. I did have interests here and there and like nature and angels. And, you know, I was told it was wrong, but once I was able to get rid of these rigid beliefs, <laughs> I think it was Weight Watchers that told me having a fixed mindset was not good. And that's what made me say, oh, okay, I want to be more open-minded, you know? And so I just started, and, and in Christian college, I learned about, <clears throat> I have world history, and I learned about all other religions. And I was like, I had noticed that. There was truth in all of them. And um, I just realized at that moment how ridiculous it was to think that there's only one way to relate to God, to relate to angels, to communicate with beings without bodies. So it's been a long, long journey, but in the end, the, the religion for me now is no religion. <laughs> and definitely not um, Christianity or the Bible, because I... As a feminist, now I don't think it's good for women, and I don't think it's good for empaths who can easily get trapped into abuse and narcissism out of, you know, their good hearts. For me, when I see Archangel Michael, he is just like that typical, um, he's beautiful, like he is a beautiful, he looks like Gerald from The Witcher, but he has more maybe blonde or silver almost white hair and um he's more slender but he kind of looks like an elf too he has you know a little bit of an alien look to him very very beautiful um he can present in different ways you know sometimes he likes to pop up as an eagle sometimes he's um the angel with his big wings sometimes he has his wings down and he is very much um, a warrior. Like, he, he's funny. Like, he'll joke around with me all day. But when he's serious about something, he's very stoic. And he's a warrior. And I'm not the only one that talks to him. <laughs> Everyone is always, like, you know, gushing over him, how beautiful he is. And he, even just on the inside and out, his energy is just amazing. So, um. He is just, I don't know how he does it, be in so many places, helping so many people all at the same time. I do know that when something big is going on, like right, right now, a lot of things are going on in the world. He spent a lot of time with me. Um, 
before all that started going on. And now I haven't, you know, like, I don't get to be with him as much, but I understand there's like a lot going on. He still is available to me. It's just that um, it's not like in, in his full valence in front of me all the time, like it used to be. So, but you know, he, he goes through phases and God, um, to me, source God, um, when I hear the voice, it's like a mother, it's a woman. And, um, yeah, just very loving, like a mother woman and I don't get this. I don't, I haven't connected with any father, um, this father God or, um, Holy Spirit or anything like that. I feel source is also a collection of everybody all together. Um, and I don't know, it's just like we are like radio like a radio almost we can connect with any beings we want so for instance i've worked with mary i've worked with jesus um i can work with any angel i want i have an akashic records keeper who is in charge of all the records and the contracts of everything that has ever been so if a person comes to me for a relationship reading i can access these records through my record keeper, or I can ask Archangel Michael, or I can ask Source God, I can ask whoever I want. And when I'm doing a psychic reading for a person, I communicate with their higher self. And so it's their own self giving them the information about themselves. It's their self that is on the astral and higher dimension that knows what lessons that being wants to learn. So I basically just access their spiritual inner inner self to get answers or whoever they want to ask i will access it for them for everyone watching this video i hope you have a wonderful and prosperous new year my name is Moni menendez from Moni's energy tools and you can reach me at my handle Moni's energy tools on instagram thank you